Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh everyone. I welcome you all to this meeting. Let's start the session with the Khairat. I would like to call upon Sister Sufia for the Khairat. Over to you, Sister Sufia. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Am I audible? Yes, you are. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajeem. Bismillahi r-Rahmani r-Rahim. Awka sayyibim min as-samai fihi zulimat wa ra'ad wa barq yaj'aluna asabi'ahum fi azanihim min as-sawai fi hazr al-mawt wallahu muhitum bil kafirin yakadu al-barq yakhtafu abasarahum كلما أضاء لهم شوفا وإذا أظلم عليهم قاموا ولو شاء الله لذهب بسمعهم وأبصارهم إن الله على كل شيء قدير صدق زق يا أخي سست سوفيا I would like to pass on the mic to Sister Atiba for the welcome speech and introductory talk. Over to you, Sister Atiba. Uh, uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A'uzu billahi min ash-shaytani rajim. Bismillahi wa rahmin rahim. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الأمين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد. I feel very honored. Welcome all of you, my brothers and sisters. الحمد لله. الحمد لله. We got another opportunity to attend one of the valuable session, which is about doubt. This is our second topic and third session. This topic is used need of this generation. As this age is age of skepticism, there are many sources on social media which present Islam as misguided and misinterpreted. Uh, Hassan ibn Ali reported, the messenger of Allah, peace and blessings be upon him, said, leave what makes you doubt for what does not make you doubt. Verily, truth brings peace of mind and falsehood sows doubt. Uh, before I start, pure your intention. Try to focus and understand. Silent your distraction of social media. Remember, time is very precious. It never comes back. Utilize it fully. Uh, may Allah grant us ease, protect us, guide us to the right path, make successful all of us, both of the world, and makes us companions of Jannah. Amen. Now, uh, Brother Wafi Shihad will explain beautifully, inshallah. Over to you, brother. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Am I audible? Can you see the presentation? If you can see the presentation, say yes in the chat. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, he khalaq al-wujud min al-adam, wa ja'il al-nur min al-dhulam, wa mukhrij al-sabr min al-alam, wa mulqi al-tawbati ala al-nadam, ونشكره على المصائب كما نشكره على النعم والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الأمين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وهل اللقدة من لساني يفقه قولي قال الله تعالى في قرآن الكريم بعد قول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم 
The verses which are recited, which were recited now, these are very, very powerful verses. Very, very powerful verses. And there's a particular word in this verse. وَإِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبِ Does anyone know what is the meaning of raib? Does anyone know what is the meaning of raibis? وَإِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبٍ Very good. Raib means doubt. The topic for discussion today. Now we are living in an age of skepticism. If you look at the history of the world after the Industrial Revolution, we see a huge rise in skeptical tendencies, philosophical schools of thoughts that were built upon skepticism. Now, we're going to be dealing with this topic in a bit more depth, inshallah. But before that, you know, just like I give the instructions before every class, make sure, make sure your intentions are right. Because this is extremely, extremely important. If your intentions are not right, if it's not in the you know, right place, then you guys are not going to be rewarded for, you know, spending and sacrificing your time to hear me, right? So make sure your intention is in the right place. Tell to yourself that I'm in this session, I'm listening to this session so that I can get more conviction in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that I can grow more closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you did that, say yes in the chat. If you did that, say yes in the chat. Now, one way to see if your intention is in the right place or not is just to check your situation of you listening to this session. If your intention is, is in the right place, it's going to manifest in the way you listen to. So you're going to sit straight. You're not going to be laying on the bed while you know listening to me speaking, but rather you'll be sitting with a notebook in your hands and you'll be sitting straight and you'll be very you know, keenly listening to what is being said. And if you have a notebook, Say yes in the chat. Having a notebook is very, very important. You're not computers. I'm not a computer. So, you know, we're going to be having a very deep discussion for the next one and a half hours, right? So you may forget a lot of things that are being said. So have a notebook. Very, very important. Next, most importantly, make sure you use the Zoom chat as much as you can. Okay, I'll be asking you a lot of questions. As I already mentioned that I like to keep it interactive. I like to keep it in a dialogue mode. So I'll be asking a lot of questions. Make sure you answer it in the chat. The amount of interaction or the intensity with which you interact with me in the session is finally going to determine how much output you're going to have in this session. And don't use social media while in the class and an assignment task will be given at the end of the session. Uh, the question I would like to ask you is, is how many of you did the audio task? If you did the audio task, say yes in the chat. Very good, good job, good job. Because this is extremely, extremely important. And it, all it takes is just five minutes or 10 minutes, right? So if you did the audio task, say yes in the chat. Now, the next question is, how many of you did the video assignment? How many of you did the video assignment? MashaAllah. So Alif has done it, Zainab has done it, very good. Adil, Adib, no, Kawthar, all right, mashallah. Try to do the video task as much as you can, okay, as much as you can, because this is also extremely, extremely, extremely important. And finally, most importantly, don't turn on your mic. That's it. 
With this, we are directly jumping into the session with a very, very important question. And I want you guys to answer this question or this question as sincerely as possible, as genuinely as possible. Okay. If you have any trouble answering it in the chat, I mean, you can always change your name in the Zoom, you know, settings. So you will feel more comfortable with answering me. So with that, let's directly get on with the session. The first question I would like to ask you is, is have you ever doubted your faith? in your life now with regards to doubt you know let me give you a few doubts okay it can either be why do women have to wear a hijab while men they're not you know having to wear they don't want to or they are not mandated to wear a scarf around their head allah created everything but who created allah then if allah is so kind and merciful why is there so much problems in this world LGBTQ, if they're born as homosexuals, then why is Allah punishing them? Why is it a sin if they're born in that way? I these questions. Now, all of the questions that I just asked, they have clear-cut, beautiful, wonderful, insightful, precise, accurate answers in Islamic intellectual tradition. These are all questions that have been handled really well. They have really good, you know, critical answers. They have really good critical answers. But the question is, a lot of people, a lot of people, they don't spend enough time doing the sincere research that it takes to, you know, deal with these doubts. So they have these doubts in their minds and they go forward in their life without these questions being answered. And then they get a lot more doubts, these they, they, their hearts become filled with doubts and you know that finally leads them to having very low iman and their heart finally becomes devoid of iman and then they jump out of islam and a lot of these muslims they jump out of islam they just don't jump out of islam you know normally they become ex-muslims right they become ex-muslims and they start throwing a lot of islamophobic slogans and arguments and narratives against against this beautiful religion which is you know which is finally rooted in their own ignorance now this is a very very sad reality of today i personally know a lot of young muslims who are studying in colleges i mean they had good faith until you know they were doing their high secondary schooling but you know when they went to college they may went they might have went to the united states or went to the uk or they went to the you know north indian central colleges i'm speaking for people in india or you know they got that freedom they started spring life these people almost majority of them they don't have a proper base in islamic theology islamic jurisprudence islamic sciences but then you know they started getting influenced by the environment in the college by the arguments that they are constantly hearing that are being fed into their mind knowingly or unknowingly and then finally they just filled with doubts for the first step is they slowly you know stop praying and then they slowly and slowly get into really bad behavior and then to justify their behavior you know they jump out of atheism they jump out of islam so that you know they don't feel responsible for the sins they are committing now do you know such people around you or have you heard such cases around you have you heard such cases around you now this is a very 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 prevalent phenomenon it's a very prevalent phenomenon right you know at, at the starting like it was very surprising and shocking for me but then you know the more i you know dealt with such cases in the counseling field you know like it really shocked me how prevalent such cases are how prevalent such cases are so we're going to be diving into this particular topic in a bit more depth we're going to be talking about how to deal with these doubts and we're going to be dealing with the background propagandas and agendas uh, by which a lot of these organizations are working to propound and propagate doubts in the muslim community inshallah and we'll be talking about this with an analogy from a hadith okay now this is the hadith that we're going to be discussing today the third hadith when i'm reading it i want you guys to read it with me all right from ibn umar radiallahu anhu said that allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam said I have been sent before the hour so that Allah alone should be worshipped without any partner for him. And my provision has been made, has been placed beneath the shade of my spear, 
and subservience and humiliation have been placed upon those who disobey my orders. And whoever imitates a people, then he is one of them. If you finish reading this hadith, say yes in the chat. If you finish reading this hadith, say yes in the chat. You can take a screenshot of it, or if you want, you can write it down. Now, let's have a small hadith analysis before directly going ahead. It was reported by Umar. Abdullah ibn Umar is a very, very famous companion. He's actually quite young. And he is the son of who? He is the son of He is the son of who? Very good, Abdul Rahman. He is the son of Umar bin Khattab. And, uh, you know, for the sake of information, Ibn in Arabic means for the son of. So me, you know, I'll attach my father's name to my name by using the link Ibn. That's how we usually say the name in Arabic. So my name would be Wafi Shihad bin Abdul Ahad al Madani. So whenever, you know, you say your name in Arabic, even for official purposes, for filling the documents, etc., you usually attach your father's name to your name. So I want every one of you to type your name. So if you are a boy, you would say Abdullah bin Abdullah bin Umar. If you are a girl, you would say Khadija bin Khawalid. So bin means son of. Bin is used. Ibn is also used. Same word in different forms. Bin means son of. Bint means daughter of. Bin means son of. Bint means daughter of. Okay. Now, the thing with this particular hadith is that it's very often misinterpreted. It's very, very often misinterpreted by the Islamic folks, and we'll discuss how it is, you know, uh, misinterpreted. Now, we will dissect this hadith, you know, and we will see what all different topics these hadith, this hadith talks about. Number one, it talks about the fact that Allah alone should be worshipped. Number one is that Allah alone should be worshipped. The second point it talks about is my provision has been placed beneath the shade of my spear. So I'm taking the statements from this hadith and categorizing them on the basis of the topics. The number one is worship Allah alone. Secondly, my provision has been placed beneath the shade of my spear. Thirdly, humiliation have been placed upon those who disobey my orders. Fourth, whoever imitates a people, then he is one of them. So this hadith talks about these four things and we'll be talking about or we'll be focusing on point number two and point number three. Because point number four is going to be discussed later on in the upcoming sessions. And point number one, we all know this point, right? Because this is the basis of our faith in Islam. We worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. We say, we say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh. We only worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tawheed, having clear cut aqeedah. It is the base of our religion. It is the base of our religion. We don't worship awliya. We don't worship qubur. We don't worship people. We don't worship human gods. We don't worship demigods, right? We don't worship these, these people who claim to be God. We don't do that. We only worship who? Who do we worship? Who do we worship? We worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. We don't do any shirk. We don't commit any shirk. We stand strong to the principle of tawheed, of tawheed. So this is the proper base that we all need. Regardless of what Islamic course we are doing, the first thing that we'll study is aqidah. The first thing that we study is tawheed. So tawheed is very, very important. So we'll be focusing on the second and third point. Let me read it again. My provision has been placed beneath the shade of my spear. And the third point, humiliation have been placed upon those who disobey my orders. So these are the two important statements which we are going to be focusing uh, on this hadith. All right. Now, and my provision has been placed beneath the shade of my spear and subservience and humiliation have been placed upon those who disobey my orders. I want you guys to read it three times. I want you guys to read it three times. After reading it three times, say yes in the chat. Read it three times, and after reading it three times, say yes in the chat. And my provision has been placed beneath the shade of my spear, 
and subservience and humiliation have been placed upon those who disobey my orders. Okay, now here is a question that I want to ask you. Imagine that you are a non-Muslim. Okay, imagine that you are George, uh, Brahmin, or you know any other you know non-Muslim. All right. Now imagine that you were scrolling on social media. You know, using your Snapchat, Instagram, WhatsApp, or cut, you know, Twitter, Facebook, or whatever. And you know, you're just scrolling, and you see this particular hadith with this particular image at the site. Okay, very coincidental, right? What kind of image are you going to be having about Islam, positive or negative? If you're saying positive, say P. If you're saying negative, say N. What kind of feeling are you going to get about Islam? Now, this is a very, very common thing on social media. Very, very common thing on social media. They take a particular hadith and then they put a certain image beside it. And then they try to frame it towards a certain narrative. How many of you have seen such, you know, posters on social media? How many of you have seen such posters on social media? And if you're a person who is, you know, dealing with debate groups as such, you know, Christian Muslim debate groups, uh, you know, Hindu Muslim debate groups, atheist Muslim, liberal Muslim, you know, debate groups, you would have seen this a lot, a lot. And, you know, if you go to the comment section, you know, you're going to see a lot of arguments like, uh, the prophet was a warmonger. Uh, uh, Islam is a violent religion. Islam is against humanity. It, you know, Muslims are terrorists. Muslims are fanatics. Muslims are extremists. Muslims are this and that. Muslims are this and that. And this is a very, very prevalent occurrence. And you know what basically happens? You know what happens? A lot of young people, a lot of young people, you know, when they're usually like these innocent seven-year-old, you know, seven standard, standard social media, and they're seeing all these things, they're just confused. They're just honestly confused. They, they really don't know what to believe. They really don't know what to believe. And in psychology, we say that human beings tend to conform to the views that they are always seeing. Human beings tend to conform to the views that they are always seeing. So when they're constantly exposed to such filth, when they're constantly exposed to such false pseudo-intellectual arguments, they're going to be very, very misinformed. They're going to be really, really misinformed. Sorry, my mic got turned off. So we need to be really, really careful about how we approach these issues, how we approach these issues. Now, what do you think? Are these comments valid? Are these comments you know, authentic? Are these comments true? Are these comments true? We know that it's false innately, right? But a lot of little children, they really don't know whether it's true or false, whether it's true or false. And sadly, we live in a time of misinformation, misquotation, misrepresentation, and mispresentation, where in which a lot of these Islamophobic arguments are constantly propounded on social media. So we've got to be really, really careful. Wherever we look, we see deception. We see inaccurate information. We see a lot of lies, a lot, a lot of lies, right? Right. So we've got to be really, really careful. And the fact is, there are a lot of millions and millions of Islamophobic pages, websites and organizations on the Internet and beyond that claims to spread lies against Islam, that claims to spread lies against Islam. OK, if you know this guy, don't comment his name on the chat. OK, if you know this guy, say yes. If you don't know, say no. Don't comment his name on the chat. Now, if you don't know, say Alhamdulillah, because this guy, like, he's a pathological liar. And he, you know, uh, uh, posts a lot of Islamophobic videos. He posts a lot of Islamophobic videos. And recently, you know, he deleted a lot of these videos very strangely. And he gave his channel to another person. But the thing is, like, this guy used to be a psychopath. You know, that's his history. But then, like, the things that he says about Islam... Like it's constant lies, like it constantly, constantly lies about, you know, Islam. And the thing is, when we see such, you know, channels, even in Kerala, okay, don't comment the channels on the chat because those people don't know about it. 
you know, they might become curious and, and search it up, right? And there are problems with this curiosity. I'll talk about the problem with such, you know, innocent curiosity very soon, inshallah. But what we need to understand is there are a lot of such channels. There are a lot of such channels, you know, ex-Muslim related organizations, ex-Muslims related organizations, right? I mean, if you came out of something, you won't necessarily, and you believe that it's wrong, you won't necessarily tie to your name and call it with an X. Right. And that is a funny thing. They, they, you know, these people, they came out of Islam and they still want to identify by using the label Muslims or by using the label Islam. And the funny thing is this, you know, if you go to their you know, pages and, and websites and, and, and channels, and we may think that these organizations, they're just working for the sake of working you know, to spread awareness or to, to propagate their views. But the reality is this. Okay, I want I don't want to name the channels, but just do understand that these channels are very, very well funded. They're, the videos that they're putting forth, they're being paid huge amount of dollars. These guys are being paid huge amount of dollars, and there are clear cut evidences for this. I'm not only talking in case of Caroline India, I'm talking internationally. I'm talking internationally, and we'll look at a few of these evidences very soon. So what these guys, they try to do is they build hate against Muslims and also work within young Muslim communities to sow seeds of doubt to weaken faith. So be wary of where, very, very wary of where you take knowledge from. Don't go to the internet. If you have a doubt, yes, you can use internet as a source of general research. But if you're having doubts about aqidah and all these things, go to a sheikh that you know who is very intellectual and very well learned, Ask him this question, you know, face to face and get your doubts cleared. You know, Muslims, we are not, we don't, we don't fear doubts. We don't fear doubts. We religion with 1,400 years of intellectual tradition, intellectual tradition. We're not afraid of doubts. But the problem is the way in which they spread with regards to the answers of these doubts, it is really, really problematic. So if you have doubts, go to a sheikh and get it cleared. Or, you know, if you're searching on YouTube or Google, stick to certain people who you know are very well learned, very well learned. And the sad thing is a lot of these Muslims, a lot of these Muslims, they fall into this trap very, very sadly, very, very sadly. You know, I had a case as also because, before coming to Egypt, uh, there was a, the, I, got, I got a call and this call was from a few students of a college in Malapura. All right. And they said that there is a guy in their class you know, he's studying their degree. I don't want to say which department, but he's doing his, uh, remember correctly. And, you know, he's almost becoming an atheist and he's spreading a lot of Islamophobic, you know, videos in their class groups. So they called me to talk to him. And, you know, we went and we selected, you know, I, I went to the house of his friend and all the, you know, classmates, they gathered in the home. And we had almost like a debate, it was a debate, a discussion type of a, of, of a meeting. And I started talking to him. And the very funny thing is, the guy has been watching this Islamophobic videos for the past one or two years, like straight. That's the only thing he's watching. And the guy is like almost brainwashed. The moment he opens his mouth, the kind of filth that is spitting, these are the kinds of lies that you would hear any Islamophobe saying. And this guy is actually from a really, really religious background. His father is a very religious man. His mother is a very religious man. And it's very, very sad to see this. It's very, very sad to see this. I know many of you will also be able to relate to such cases, to such cases. Now, these doubts can be very, very easily, you know, solved, but it requires you to go to a person who have learned these subjects, right? Don't ask any Tom, Dick and Harry. So be very careful about where you take your knowledge from. And, and we live in an age of skepticism. Does anyone know what skepticism is? Anyone know what skepticism is? Skepticism, skeptic tendencies. You may have heard about this term, skepticism. Now, skepticism is basically a school in philosophy, which basically is built upon the principle of doubt everything, all right? Question everything, right? It has a good side and a bad side. Doubts, let me ask you, are doubts problematic? Are doubts problematic? Is asking questions problematic? No, it's actually a good thing. Asking doubt is a good thing. Human mind, we are naturally inquisitive. We want to inquire and we want to know more, right? We want to know more. We are naturally, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
has built us like that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has built us like that. He gave us a brain that is very, very powerful. That is very, very powerful. But with regards to doubt, there are constructive doubts and then there are destructive doubts. There are constructive doubts and then there are destructive doubts. Let me give you an example. When was this? It was on Friday. So on Friday, you know, I went to a masjid here uh, in Egypt. It's the masjid of Sheikh Usama Abdul Azim. I was a former professor of Islamic jurisprudence at uh, Azhar University. And, you know, I came out of the masjid after the khutbah and I met a person and uh, his name is Musab. Uh, he's actually from UK and he used to be like if he was born into a Christian family. Then he became a liberal. Then he became an atheist. And what basically happened is this. He he's from Birmingham in UK and uh, he went to learn philosophy. He went to learn philosophy. Now, when you learn a lot of different schools of thoughts and philosophy and you get into a quagmire, a quagmire of doubts and you get into deep existential crises. And this guy, he was like literally at the verge of committing suicide. He became narcissistic. He became extremely skeptic. And by extreme skepticism, I meant he started questioning his own existence. He started questioning his own existence and he asked questions like, what if I'm just dreaming? What if this life is not real? What if the real life is after, you know, this life, which is true in certain senses, but, you know, he wants to find the real truth and he's, you know, almost trying to commit suicide. He became extremely, extremely narcissistic. And this is actually the problem with regards to doubts and getting into the field of philosophy. So guys, if, girls, if any one of you would like to study philosophy, you got to be really, really careful. First, have a proper, proper base in Islamic sciences. And this is also one of the uh, 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 advices that I was given by a scholar here. Uh, you know, I asked him whether I should be getting into a department for my master's here in, in advanced philosophy and theology. He told me, Wafi, la buddha anta tadurus al-aqidat al-sahih wa ta'akhud al-asas fi darasat al-islamiyah qabla anta tadurus al-falsafa. Well, this is very, very important. If you don't have a clear cut base in Islamic science before getting into philosophy, before getting into philosophy, before getting into this advanced field of studies, it's going to be extremely, extremely problematic for you. Now, coming back to the story, this brother, Musab, is actually traveling to UK today. After 10 years, subhanAllah, he converted to, to Islam at the age of 25. He stayed in Egypt for 10 years. Now, today night, he's returning back to back to UK, mashallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give him, uh, bless him with a safe journey. Anyway, you know, listening to his, you know, uh, his life story, actually, I was able to relate a lot with the, with the situation back in Caroline, India, right? A lot of these people, they listen to a lot of these contents on, you know, YouTube by people who are having suits and ties. And, you know, I don't know if the inferiority complex is still there in the minds of a lot of people or not, but I've seen this in a lot, in a lot of people. You know, they have this inferiority complex in their minds that if a person wears a suit and a coat, if a person speaks really British English and he's saying really stupid things, even though the things he's saying is really stupid, they'll take it as extremely, extremely intellectual. And there is this sense of inferiority complex deep in their minds, deep in their minds. When they look at the, the shiur who speak Arabic, the, the, the people of, of Islam and, you know, the, the scholars of Islam who are wearing, you know, traditional clothes, they look at them as, you know, backward, as inferior. Well, when they look at people who are having suits and coats, you know, they feel, oh man, these guys are very intellectual. These guys are, you know, highly authentic and, you know, uh, you know, huge scholars, right? They have these kinds of deeply, you know, embedded inferiority complex in them. And a lot of these people, they, they, they follow Richard Dawkins and Daniel Dennett and all these, uh, you know, uh, people who really don't have a proper base. If you study their, you know, their, their, arguments in depth, you're going to find a lot of problems, a lot of problems. There was another guy, an atheist, who came and he, you know, he had the book God Delusion with him by Dr. Richard Dawkins. Uh, and the guy was like, he holded it like a, like a Bible, right? Like a Bible. And the guy is coming to me and the guy is saying, look, this book explains everything. This book has the best answers. And, you know, I found all the answers to all my questions in this book. And the, the guy was literally appreciating Dr. Richard Dawkins, like he's a god or something, right? And he bought the book. And I asked him the first question, have you read this book completely? And you know what answer he gave? Not completely, but yes, he has read few parts of it, right? 
And then he basically jumped into a conclusion without proper research. So I asked him to open page number 157 and 158, and I asked him to read the proper argumentation in that book. And when I told him in the internal you know, contradictions with the arguments, the guy was really astonished. Because till that time, he was blaming Muslims as blind believers, while he himself was a blind believer, you know, looking, you know, jumping out of Islam due to inferiority complex. So there are a lot of such cases. Now, coming back to our discussion, we need to be very, very careful in this age of skepticism. Protecting our Iman, this is our fundamental responsibility. Protect your Iman as much as you can. And these people, they implement a lot of, or they use, make use of a lot of psychological tools and logical fallacies to spread misinformation. For example, the disinformation campaigns, we all know this a lot, right? Then, you know, in their videos, they use a lot of catchy titles. For example, 10 things, 10 shocking things you didn't know, know about Muslims, right? Have you seen such titles while scrolling on your social media, WhatsApp, you know, YouTube? 10 shocking things you never knew. Or maybe the title is like this. If you knew this about Aisha, you're going to be shocked. Or 10 mind-blowing things about such and such or such and such, right? <laughs> so this, this is basically, you know, baiting, click baiting, right? Using catchy titles. And a lot of young Muslims, they're very innocent guys, right? They're very genuine. And they just look at it. Wow, what is this information? I need to know this information. Then they just rightly click on it. And that's a trap. That's a trap. Then, you know, framing of words. You know, certain things, they frame it in certain ways to appear very negative. For example, the hadith that we read. The hadith that we read. We're going to be analyzing this hadith in a bit more depth, inshallah. If you don't have time, we'll be continuing the same session in the next week also. So this hadith, did it look negative or positive? Did it look negative or positive? It looked end, right? It looked, it looked negative. And the thing is, this particular hadith, that is cropped up from a particular from a larger hadith and then you know put a certain image at the side like it, it, it's framed in such a way to to propagate a certain narrative this is very very clear and then we have the emotional appeals the emotional appeals especially when we deal with lgbtq activists you know when we deal with them with rational and logical arguments that are clearly scientific based on biological research then this you know get on to, to the appeal then they get onto the emotional appeal. They say, uh, you know, I was abused in my childhood and therefore, you know, you have to accept my stance. Yes, we are sympathetic towards you for the abuse that you have gone through in your life and we will help you as much as we can as Muslims. But then that doesn't necessarily justify your moral narrative for rationalizing uh, homosexuality. Right. So emotional appealing that like, this is too much. This is too much. Right. If you deal with this woke kind of people, they get triggered very fast. They get triggered very, very fast. Right. They get triggered very fast. So so this kind of emotional appealing is is always used, is always used by this Islamophobes. Then we have something called as classical conditioning, classical conditioning, uh, students of psychology. How many students of psychology are here? If you're a student of psychology, say yes in the chat. Now, if you're a student of psychology, you would have obviously heard about the theory of classical conditioning. Now, classical conditioning is basically a theory in which, you know, two stimulus, they're conditioned with each other through, you know, different processes. All right. I don't wish to get to, to the, to, you know, more sophistications of this particular theory, but just understand that classical conditioning is also used by, for example, in the news, they gave, they, they'll give a, 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 you know, a news about a terrorist attack or an extremist related or, or something, you know, uh, very harmful, something that is very terrorizing. All right. Then right after it, they'll show an image of a lady with a niqab or a man with a beard. They will not directly tell you that this, both these newses are interconnected. They'll not tell you. But the more a person sees this, like they see a terror activity, then they see a, the picture of a woman with niqab or, or a man with beard. They see, a, you know, a, a news about news about, you know, domestic abuse, and then right after it, they'll give some, you know, program happening in some madras or something with a woman in niqab. Now, what basically happens is the more you see such news, you're going to be classically conditioned to relate both these, uh, both these, you know, uh, situations or both these cases. 
So classic conditioning is, is very, very often used. Then we have the case of misquotation and misrepresent, misrepresentation. We all know this. I don't want to explain it more in more depth. So there are a lot of psychological tools that are being used by these Islamophobes. So you've got to be very, very careful. Now, let me tell you another example. I don't want to say his, uh, but the people in Kerala, you might have you know, heard this person on, uh, on YouTube, uh, but I would, you know, just for the sake of specifying, you know, his name is something like Dash Analyst, okay? Dash Analyst, don't comment his name on the chat, all right? Don't comment his name on the chat. Now, the thing with such people, okay, the Dash Analyst guy, he posts videos on a lot of different topics in a very neutral way, in a very, very neutral way. The way he talks is a very, in, in a very neutral sense in a very neutral sense. But, you know, he's basically working with a clear-cut liberal atheistic propaganda. This is very clear. So they speak in a very neutral term. They speak very nicely. They present their, you know, arguments in a very nice way. And a lot of people, even though their arguments are really bankrupt, you know, intellectually bankrupt, they still fall into such arguments, all right? So understand that there are a lot of, you know, psychological tools and techniques employed by these people. So don't fall for it, all right? And coming back, and coming back to the earlier discussion, these people, they're getting paid tons and tons of money. The Islamophobia industry, okay, this is a report by Al Jazeera, and this is a report from long back, long back. So now it's, it's much, much more higher. In 2013 alone, which is about now, the inner core groups of Islamophobes had access to $34 million in revenue. $34 million in revenue. Do you know how much time it takes to, to make $34 million? These guys are making it. So this is basically an, indus an industry. This, you know, these guys make a lot of money. They make a lot of money. There's a good book written by uh, Nathan Lean. Uh, it's titled The Islamophobia Industry, and it rightly talks about the internal nuances of this particular topic, right? During that 33-year period, inner core groups had access to at least 204 million in total revenue. 240, 204 million in total revenue. So understand that this is well-funded. This is well, well funded. And then, you know, there's another thing, you know, people being paid. There are some Christians who are being paid a lot of money to act like Muslims, to grow their beard, right? Go to some Arab countries, spend one year there. And then rightly after that, they come to the United States. You know, then they make a video, you know, after learning a little bit of Arabic, they say, Assalamu alaikum, you know, with the proper makharaj al haruf and the lahja of Arabs speaking the Arabic language and say, Assalamu alaikum, I have been a Muslim for the last, uh, you know, uh, uh, 20 years and 30 years. After being a Muslim, after propagating this religion for the last 30 years, you know, I have chosen to come out of Islam, right? Have you guys seen such people? Have you guys seen such, uh, you know, uh, videos? Very common, very common. <laughs> they start calling them ex-Muslims. And the funny thing is, if we have like direct, straightforward debate with them and we ask this question, uh, uh, how many raka'a is there in Surah Yasin? How many raka'a is there in Surah Yasin? If you had these videos, subhanAllah, it's really funny. And the guy or the girl was saying, there are three, three raka'as in Surah Yasin. Like, what are you talking about? Are there raka'as in Surah Yasin? There was a, there was a good you know, video published by Unmasking Atheism. You know, I usually, you know, when I, when I go into deep research and, you know, my mind gets a bit, you know, uh, pressured, I usually go and watch such uh, videos. Like, it's really funny. It's really funny, right? Anyway, anyway, so these people, they're really ignorant. These guys, they're very, very ignorant when it comes to Islam, but they, you know, label themselves as, as experts on the topic and they speak with a lot of authority. So don't fall for it. Now, you may have come across a lot of such materials. Across such materials that make you question your faith. For example, related to LGBTQ, homosexuality related questions. These are the three things that you need to follow. Number one, never ever jump, ever jump to conclusions. This will cause you to weaken Iman and even destroy your faith. Destroy your faith com completely completely a lot of people have this tendency of jumping into conclusions they just jump into conclusion they just jump into conclusion i had a case of a kid who was from eighth standard eighth standard and uh, he his family they're all from kerala but you know they stayed in scotland for a few years and then they moved back to london now he's basically studying in london and the guy you know he basically goes to a public school in uk 
the problem with these public schools is dating culture, you know, homosexuality and everything. Like, it's very common. If you come out and say that you are gay, they'll call you brave. You're very brave to, to stick to your identity and all these things. All right. Like, this is a very sad thing. Even like India is also, you know, becoming westernized with a very, very fast pace. If you come out as a gay, you know, everyone will comment, uh, you are very brave. You know, you are an extremely brave person. You are very strong to, to you know, sticking with your, with your identity. Right. You're very confident, etc. You're very confident, etc. This is this is very clearly psychologically designed, very clearly psychologically designed. When I studied the case of this boy and the, the reason why they brought him back to Kerala is that if they went to counselors in the UK, you know what they're going to do? These counselors, they're going to you know file a case against their parents. Now, what basically happened to this boy is this. The boy, he, he went to the public school system and he's constantly interacting with a lot of these LGBTQ activists on social media and you know, listening to a lot of their filth, a lot of their filth. And, you know, he started questioning his own gender. All right. He started questioning his own gender, you know, following the gender fluidity theory, which is a really baseless theory, like a really baseless theory. Anyway, he started questioning his gender. He's thinking, am I a boy or am I a girl? Have you seen such cases where in which, you know, these young people, they start questioning their gender. Am I a boy or am I a girl? Right. And the guy started, you know, wearing, you know, feminine type of dresses and all these things. And their parents got very concerned. And, you know, when I researched more about his case, what basically happened is this. He was constantly interacting with these LGBTQ activists. He was having a lot of questions in mind. These doubts were not addressed. These doubts were not addressed. He jumped into a conclusion that Islam is not a true religion because Islam is not inclusive of these things, right? If you go to such people's, you know, bio, you know, on Instagram, you might have seen she or her, they or them, he or them. Like, have you seen such tags or such labels? Like. That, is, that shows the ignorance of these people. Even there are Muslims who do it. There are Muslims who do it without properly understanding what it means. You're ascribing to a theory that completely goes against Islam, that completely goes against Islamic jurisprudence, right? So anyway, anyway, never ever jump to conclusions when you see such information on social media. And number two, number two, remember that the doubt that you have in your mind is not a new doubt. You're not the first person, you're not the first person to, to, to build this doubt in your mind, all right? To come out with this doubt. Islam is a religion with 1,400 years of rich intellectual academic heritage. We have, you know, big, huge scholars like Imam Shafi'i, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, right? Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam an nawawi Subhanallah, these people, like these were huge masterminds, huge masterminds. If you go to uh, the masjid of Imam Shafi'i here in Egypt, you can go to directly go to his masjid and outside his masjid you know they have the biography not a complete biography but you know a few information you know written uh, on a board and there it says imam shafi'i imam shafi'i had photographic memory photographic memory these were intellectual masterminds ibn taymiyyah ibn taymiyyah was an intellectual mastermind ibn al-qayyim was an intellectual mastermind imam nawawi was an intellectual mastermind and these people, they, they completely devoted their entire lives, entire lives for the sake of gaining knowledge. Gain knowledge. If you read the book by Sheikh Abdul Fattah Abu Ghudda, it's, uh, it's titled Safahat min Sabar al Ulama. This book rightly explains how much these people, you know, focus on gaining knowledge. Like they spend their entire time in books, you know, discussions, debates, and all these things. SubhanAllah. So we have a very rich intellectual academic tradition. All right. If you saw some people like, you know, today we have certain scholars, I do not wish to name them. If anybody comes into your mind, keep it in your mind. Don't comment. All right. There are some scholars who come out and, you know, they may not have proper expertise in particular topics. And they say really, you know, questionable things on, on, on you know, platforms and on mics, etc. And these people like, you know, the, the general audience, they, the, you know, those people who hear them, they think, why are they saying such, you know, illogical, irrational, you know, such things that are clearly immoral, etc. And then they think that the entire intellectual Islamic tradition is like that. No, no. If you hear somebody saying, somebody who claims themselves as a scholar, say, saying something that is really questionable, don't judge the entire intellectual Islamic heritage as such, all right? 
All right. So, so remember that Islam is a religion with 1,400 years of rich intellectual academic heritage. And number three, ask a well-learned scholar of Islam. Don't ask any Tom, Dick and Harry you see on the street, but rather ask a person who's very, very well read in these topics. And I can assure you that all your doubts, all your doubts are going to be clarified, inshallah. Okay, all your doubts are going to be clarified. Islam, Islam is very, very deep religion. It's the truth, it's the haqq. It is the hack. So there is no scope in Islam for doubts. Okay, you can ask doubts, but it's hundred percent. So if there are people here, you know, who are doubting certain aspects of Islam, don't worry. All right, don't worry. Never jump into conclusion. Remember the Islamic intellectual tradition and ask a scholar who is very well learned. And don't jump into you know direct conclusion if you just did not find the answer in in one to two days. But research as much as you can. All right, research as much as you can. Now. Just look at these three points. If you have committed these three points to memory, or if you have understood these three points very well, say yes in the chat. Say yes in the chat. Now, I'm not going to be giving you direct answers to all, a lot of these questions, but it's going to take a lot of time. It's going to take a lot of time to deal with each of these questions. For example, LGBTQ, for example, you know, the, the liberal psychological arguments that they you know, constantly put forth. But what I'm gonna do is, I'll give you certain sources so you can search it up. All right, you can search it up. Okay, now uh, this topic we're going to be discussing in the next class, inshallah. You know, the, the moderation, like what is a moderate path? Like on the one side, you see liberal Muslims saying that everything is okay, like everything is halal, LGBTQ is halal. If you go to college, if you go to college, and recently there was the you know news from Kerala in which you know, there were certain boys and girls who were sitting together or, or on a bench in, in a bus waiting shit. Have, have you guys seen it? Have you guys seen it? And they were saying, this is progressive. This is the best. You know, we are the most progressive liberal people. SubhanAllah. Like, it's a very, very stupid act. A very, very stupid act. Anyway, we're not going to be getting into the nuances of, of a lot of these things. But I need you to understand is, you know, there's a moderation in Islam. We don't say everything is haram and we don't say everything is halal. Okay, so the path of moderation is going to be discussed in the next uh, session, inshallah. Now, the thing is, watching the contents that create doubts actually have subconscious effect. Some people, you know, they say, I want to watch it just for knowing what their arguments are. Some people, you know, they're just naturally curious, right? Some people, you know, they think that there might be something to laugh in these videos so that, you know, they just watch these videos for the sake of watching. But the thing we need to understand is it's going to have subconscious effect on your mind. It's going to have subconscious effect on your mind. So don't directly go and click on, on, on videos and, and articles that might cause harm to your iman. Protect your heart. Protect your heart as much as you can. Protecting the heart is extremely, extremely important. It's, it's very, very important. All right. So don't go and expose yourself to these filth, these things that will, you know, lead to a lot of problems in your mind. All right. Now, try to follow, like if you're using social media, try to follow as much, you know, Islamic, Islamic da'wah initiatives as much as possible. All right. Fill your social media feed with authentic Islamic material. There are a lot of good you know, Instagram pages that you can follow. There are a lot of good scholars on YouTube. Try to subscribe. Try to like their videos. Try to support them as much as you, know, you can. They may not ask for like and support, but you know, if you do it, the material is going to be recommended to a lot more people. So try to, try to you know, uh, participate in this dialogue, even with the little of liking and sharing. Like that's the least we can do. That's the least we can do, right? So fill your social media feed with positive Islamic contents. So next time you open social media, you get to listen to the Quran, you get to listen to the, the, the lectures of the Mashaykh. You know, this is, this is going to be really beneficial for you rather than just following all those memes and troll pages, right? Right? Now, the question I would like to ask you is, what are some Islamic Dara channels and pages you know? And we're going to be having a discussion on this in the COJ Ummah group, inshallah, so that you can all share the sources that you know, and you know we can all you know benefit each other, inshallah. All right. So we have got a lot of a lot of good you know Islamic pages. Try to follow them. Try to follow them as much as you can. You're going to benefit a lot, inshallah. Okay. Now let's get into the into the uh, uh, hadith. I'm going to be getting into a bit more depth about this hadith, and you're going to get a proper perspective. Now, when we saw this hadith, like some of you said that. You know, you got a negative view, right? A lot of people they were saying you got a negative view. Now, this hadith is going to be viewed by two kinds of people. Okay, two kinds of people. 
Number one are those who know, are, number one are those laymen, the general people, the general people who don't know Arabic, and this, they just depend on the English translation. They really don't know much about Islamic sciences, much about Islamic sciences. If you fall into that category, even then you can find clear cut justifications for this particular, for this particular con uh, you know, concept or the message that is being conveyed by this particular hadith. And that is that, okay, before that, you know, if you are a person like a non-Muslim having a prejudice, you know, an already deeply embedded prejudice that all Muslims are extremists, what are you basically going to do? Like if you just see these two like provision and spear, the conclusion that you're going to come to is the Prophet Sallallahu was a war monger, right? So they will come to these false conclusions. But then these conclusions can be very clearly, very clearly refuted. And all it takes is a little bit of research, a little bit of research, right? We know that a part of jizya was given to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was very clearly justified. It doesn't mean the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was a war monger. And we know that he was a man of mercy. He was rahmatul alamin. He was never arrogant. He never engaged in war until absolutely justified and necessary. 13 years in Mecca without war. 13 years in Mecca without war. So if you conduct a general historical study, this doubt can easily, easily be cleared, right? Now, the next group of people who are going to be viewing this hadith is this, all right? Who dig deep to understand what the hadith is saying at the Arabic script by understanding the concept and learning more about it, by learning more about it. And this is the category of people we should be falling into. We should be falling into. Now let's look at this hadith again. Now does anyone, anyone know what the Arabic word for sword in Arabic is? In Arabic is what is the Arabic word for sword? S-W-O-R-D. Very good. Saif, right? Saif. Now there are a lot of words in Arabic for the word sword. Like over a hundred translations, all right? Now sword has over a hundred names in Arabic. And it is a word that is very, very commonly used. It's a very, very commonly used word. Then the question we need to be asking ourselves is, if the Prophet Sallallahu wanted to, wanted to, you know, uh, uh, refer to something related to war, something related to, to, you know, fighting, right? Something related to battle, would he be using spear or would he be using sword? And considering the fact that sword is a very commonly used word in the Arabic language, which would he be using? Of course, he'll be using, you know, any of the hundred words that can be used to indicate the word sword, right? It's the word spear here. So that actually makes us question, what does the Prophet ﷺ really mean? And we need to get into proper contextual study to understand it, but I'm giving a simplistic explanation. The opinion by a lot of scholars is that this word here is used in the form of an ishara. Ishara, okay, I don't want to get into more technical terminology, but Ishara basically means symbolic, symbolic. So this hadith basically uses the word spear in a very symbolic term. So the scholars, they studied the context, they studied the internal nuances of this hadith, they studied everything with rela related to the explanatory, uh, you know, scopes of this hadith, and then they concluded that the truth is the word spear used in this hadith is a form of Ishara. Now, what does Ishara mean? It means it's symbolic. Now that actually gives us a lot more insights. It actually gives us a lot, a lot more insights. And that is this, and that is, it signifies something deep, all right? So if you study the proper context of the Arabian culture at that time, sword was actually used to symbolize fighting, right? Sword was used to symbolize fighting, uh, you know, any hadith or any, you know, sayings that were related to fighting, they, they used sword for it. And spear was something they used to symbolize for hard work. For hard work, they used to use spear for their general, you know, you know, daily hard work. All right. So spear actually symbolizes hard work. So what basically the Prophet is saying that I'm going to work and be self-sufficient. Like that is the real meaning of what this means. I'm going to be, I'm going to work and be self-sufficient. So in, in Islam, we know the upper hand is better than the lower hand, which means the giving hand is better than the receiving hand. The giving hand is better than the receiving hand and we need to work hard and earn a living earn a living so look at it this hadith which seemed to have a very negative meaning due to our own lack of knowledge contains insights that are really really deep and profound deep and profound so imagine like the people who jumped into conclusion what a different conclusion did they jump into like a totally different conclusion a totally different meaning than what was actually being said what was actually being said. So what I'm trying to present to you 
is the psychological process in which these like through which these islamophobes they don't do much research they don't do much searching they don't do much proper study they just jump into conclusions by not understanding what the hadith or what the saying fully means so this is why it's important to not jump into conclusions when we see something based on the little knowledge we have right now going into a bit more explanatory depth of this hadith hard work is, is always the character of a true believer we've got to work really really hard if you need to succeed in the deen, we've got to work hard. If you've got to succeed in the dunya, we've got to work hard. If you've got to succeed in the akhirah, we've got to work really hard. And the great humble scholar, Abu Bakr al-Khalal, he actually wrote a book titled Al-Hathwa ala tijarati wa sana'a, which means how Islam encourages to trade, how Islam encourages to trade and manufacture. So entrepreneurship actually has a huge, huge importance in our religion. A huge, huge importance in our religion. Being self-sufficient has really, really huge importance in our religion. Hard work has a lot of, lot of importance in our religion. All right. So let's ponder on this hadith. Let's ponder a little bit more on this hadith. So we know that today Muslims have become users and not producers. We have become users and not producers. But when we look into history, when we look into history, we see that there was a, an age of Islam that was called as a golden age of Islam. That was an age when which we discovered we invented, we were the pioneers of discoveries and we were the pioneers of inventions. We were the pioneers of science, the pioneers of science, Ibn Sina, Jabir ibn Hayyan. We know a lot of these intellectual masterminds who contributed to the development of the world as a whole. Can you name a few inventions by Muslims? Can you name a few inventions by Muslims? Anyone? Coffee, lens, algebra, mirror, there are a lot of these inventions and subhanallah you know i i remember very precisely like when i was a child i think it was in fifth standard and the fifth standard uh, i used to be studying in qatar and uh, you know there was an exhibition it was called as one you know inventions all right the exhibition was called as 1001 inventions and we were taken from the school to see this exhibition it was really fun and subhanallah like i was mind blown i was mind blown 1001 inventions by by muslim you know uh, uh, inventors and discoverers and scholars mind blown 1001 inventions how many do we know how many how, how many do we know right even when we're studying psychology we are not even you know taught about the muslim psychologists the pioneers of the field of psychology al-balghi if you if you're a student of psychology and you're a muslim and if you don't know al-balghi we have been really really ignorant so try to learn about al balkhi his theory of cognitive uh, be, be, you know behavioral therapy and all this like it, it, it's amazing it's really really amazing all right so there was a time when muslims we were the pioneers we were the producers but sadly today muslims have become the users muslims have become the users so we got to we got to focus more on entrepreneurship we got to focus more on creativity and novelty so invest in your skills and contribute to the society while earning and we are living in an age of digital era right? The opportunities are endless. Even if you're a housewife in your home, there are a lot of opportunities for you to study. There are a lot of opportunities for you to gain certificates. There are a lot of opportunities through which you can contribute towards the society. The opportunities are literally endless, literally endless. If you want to study programming, it can be very easily you know, ac accessed. There are a lot of these academics that are offering free online courses, right? So, so we got to focus more on this particular aspect. We've got to work really, really hard. And one of the best qualities a Muslim youngster can have is focusing on the ways to become self-sufficient. So study hard and work hard. Study hard and work hard. And the Sahabi once came to the Prophet ﷺ and asked him for some money. And the Prophet told him, and you know, he told the Prophet that he's broke. And the Prophet said, you going out and working hard is better than me giving you the sadaqah. So the Prophet ﷺ is giving huge, huge advices huge huge advices right now this is also a topic that we don't need to discuss in much depth but just so that you know the people who are studying commerce and economics we are actually moving on to a world that is going to be built upon gig economy so if you want to survive in such a world you have to focus on updating and upgrading your skills okay try to uh, journey through multiple disciplines try to gather as much as certificates as you can there are a lot of there are a lot of opportunities online you can gain you know, certificates, like if you're doing your bachelor's, all right, if you're doing your bachelor's, you can get a lot of diplomas alongside your, your bachelor's, and that'll really add in, that'll really, really add in to your skill set. You know, I did it, and I'm really, really 
you know, happy that I chose to do it. It was really hard work while I was studying in my degree. I did uh, four other diplomas, but you know, by the time I finished my degree, I not only had one degree certificate, I had about uh, three diploma certificates, one uh, full year certificate. There, there were multiple certificates that I took, which really, really helped me progress uh, in my journey. So what I'm saying is try to focus more on building and progressing because you're going to be, you're going to find huge benefit in it, especially with regards to the world that is going to come. And being career oriented doesn't mean you have to become materialistic. A lot of people, they think that if they, if they got to become a good Muslim, they got to, you know, wear, you know, an, an old cloth. They got to, you know, walk like a beggar and, you know, uh, they should not focus on, on their career. They should not go to school, just sit in the masjid and, you know, just, just sit there. Is that what it means to be a good Muslim? Is that what it means to be a good Muslim? Being career oriented doesn't mean that you become materialistic. No. No, this is not what it means. There's a proper balance that the Prophet ﷺ taught us. And more about this proper balance and moderation will be taught in the next session, inshallah. And many people, they interpret the meaning of tawakkul, right? Right? They, they, they interpret the meaning of tawakkul. They say that, you know, if they just sit at home, the risk is going to come. No, the risk is not going to come to you. You got to go out and strive to get it. Strive to get it, subhanAllah. SubhanAllah. Now, I want you guys to go back to the hadith that you have written and read it again read it again like how much insights the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is giving us giving us and there's a thing that you know that's very peculiar to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and that is when he speaks he speaks very little but the insights in his words they are very very deep and in arabic there's a particular terminology for it does anyone know this there's actually a word that describes this particular characteristic of the Prophet Sallallahu communication. Does anyone know this? It's called as Jawami'ul al Kalim. Jawami'ul al Kalim. All right. Jawami'ul al Kalim basically means the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam speaks very, very little. Very, very little. He says things in a very precise manner. Right. But when we search more about it, when we analyze and research more about it, it contains mind blowing insights. It contains mind blowing insights. Right. So imagine a person who just misjudged this hadith, they would have come to a, a totally different conclusion that's far, far from reality, far from, from reality. And when we usually, you know, explain the, the context of this hadith and the textual meaning of this hadith, you know what they say? What the atheists say? Oh, you're just playing mental gymnastics. You're just playing, you're just trying to water it down. You're just trying to whitewash it. You're just trying to whitewash it. You're trying to apply something called as a putty. Right. That's what these people say. Have you heard such arguments from Islamophobes? And this shows how ignorant they are, how ignorant they are. When we try to give them the proper knowledge with regards to the context and the meaning of this hadith, they just you know, stick with to their you know, already jumped conclusion, which they already build upon their own ignorance. Right. Right. Which their Sheikh Google and Maulana YouTube taught them like a very sad reality. Right. Very sad reality. So so so, you know, to conclusion right we should not jump into conclusions and when we see such a hadith while scrolling on social media never ever jump into conclusion but try to study more about its context more about its text and you will get a proper idea of what it means inshallah now this is the next part of the hadith humiliation have been placed upon those who disobey my orders all right now this is a reality in islam we stick to the haq we don't water down things Okay, we don't we don't go to the liberal part and you know we completely liberalize the religion just so that it looks rainbow, you know, it, it looks you know happy, joyful, and all this. No, we stick to the haq. And in the hadith, it says humiliation have been placed upon those who obey, you know, who, who disobey my orders, right? Like it's very clear, it's wall there. And even we and when we look at history, history gives us numerous evidences for the fact that Muslims Islam were actually humiliated. Aum, Namrud, like we have a lot of this example in front of us. A lot of the example. So we don't need to water down anything for the sake of pleasing the liberals and the Islamophobes. We don't need to do that. We stick to the haq, we stick to the truth, we try to learn as much as we can, and we present the truth as it is. We present the truth as it is. And Ahmed Didat, you know, Ahmed Didat once said something very powerful. And Sheikh Ahmed Didat, he used to be one of my role models, subhanAllah, uh, a really, really brilliant debater. I, I used to spend a huge chunk of my childhood just constantly binge watching uh, his his lectures and his debates with with, with Christians. Subhanallah, it's so beautiful. I would really recommend a lot of you to follow the debates of of uh, Ahmad Dida. Amazing, amazing person. Now Ahmad Dida, he said, Islam will win with or without you. 
Islam will win with or without you, but without Islam, you will be lost and you will lose. You will be lost and you will lose. But we've got to stick this to our minds. There are some people who think that, you know, if I become a, if I become a non-Muslim, if I become, if I, if I leave Islam, if I leave Islam, Islam is, you know, losing. Right? Islam is losing. No, Islam is going to win with or without you. Right? Like it's, it's guaranteed that Allah and his path, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Islam is going to the haqq and is going to win. Right? So we stick to the haqq. We stick to the principles of Islam. And the aspects that we don't clearly understand, we don't jump into conclusions, we research more about it. Right? We research more about it. And there's an ayah in the Holy Quran. Which basically means, and whoever turns away from my remembrance, indeed, he will have a depressed life and we will gather him on the day of resurrection blind. And I've seen this with my own eyes. I've seen this with my own eyes. A lot of cases where in which, you know, there's, there's you know, young people who are very, you know, very charismatic, very energetic, you know, they jump into false conclusions, they come out of Islam. And they live really liberalized for the next, you know, 10 years and 12 years. They get into drugs, you know, they get into a lot of these behaviors and that mess their life up completely. They mess completely. And then they have a lot of regret. They come for counseling and then, you know, you know, uh, we give them proper understanding. They come back to Islam and, you know, then they narrate their entire story. Like it's very sad to hear. And even here, uh, I've seen a lot of guys. I would give a particular example, a friend from South Africa. South Africa is basically a country that has a lot of liberal influences. And in South Africa, the guy, you know, he was a Christian first, but a liberal kind of Christian. He lived like a life of drugs, party, sex, and alcohol. Like that was his life for years and years. He would go to the work, he would come back, you know, he would party, go to work, come back and party. His friend, his friend, like when they were doing drugs, his friend OD'd. OD basically means you know, overdose. They were taking a particular kind of drug which falls into the category of uh, uh, neurostimulants. And when you have a higher dose of neurostimulant, the blood pressure rises up and it leads to a cardiac arrest. And a friend of him died. They died while doing drugs. They died while doing drugs. They spend their entire life, you know, trying to find happiness and they just finally, you know, ends in depression, right? Like they, their life ends in depression. And we see a lot of such cases. You see a lot of such cases. So we need to understand that when we turn away from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are definitely going to be depressed. A lot of such examples are there in front of our own eyes. So we've got to stick to Islam as strongly as possible. And don't judge Islam by what some Muslims do. All right. Some Muslims, they're the black sheep. They try to do some things in the name of Islam. Well, you know, it has, it has nothing got to do with Islam. All right. Muslims are human beings. We are not perfect. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. You know, we all commit sins. We all commit sins. So don't judge a perfect religion based on the actions of imperfect human beings. If some people, you know, they blow themselves up in the name of this religion and it has got nothing to do, it has got nothing to do with Islam, why do you judge 1.6 billion people based on the action of a few thousand people? No, don't do this. Don't do this. So don't judge Islam by what some Muslims do. All right. If some Muslims are, you know, behaving in a really harsh and extreme manner, in a very fanatic manner, understand that it's their problem and not the problem with the religion itself, right? Islam is perfect, but Muslims, we are imperfect, right? We are imperfect. And it is the quality of a true mu'min to actually obey what the Prophet ﷺ has said without skepticism. The Sahaba used to say, if they knew what the, if the Prophet ﷺ gave them, you know, told them something, they would say, which basically means we hear and we obey. We hear and we obey. But does that mean like some guy on the street, they came to you and they said, the Prophet ﷺ told this. Would you just directly believe it? Is that what you're supposed to do? Like, you know, just directly believe it? No, that is not what it means. That is not what it means. There are a lot of, you know, false hadith, right? A lot of these, these false hadith that are, that, that really doesn't have any basis in Islam. And there was a time where in which people were just making up, you know, a, a new hadith to support their own false agendas. So don't just falsely and blindly believe, but do research, ask proper scholars. And when you finally understand that it's from Rasulullah you say, Samirna wa ta'na, we hear and we obey. And it's a quality of a true movement. It's a quality of a true movement. Because when you doubt the Prophet, it's indirectly doubting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And we know the Prophet ﷺ used to speak under divine commands, right? He never used to speak from himself. He never used to speak from himself. So doubting the Prophet is a direct indication of a lack of faith. A lack of faith. So don't try to make excuses for things the Prophet ﷺ made haram. And don't stay away from what the Prophet ﷺ enjoyed. And we live in a time where in which haram has become the norm and halal has become, you know, something that is very strange. That's what he says. That's why the Prophet ﷺ said, Tuba lil ghuraba, which means glad tidings to the strangers. When you stick to Islam in your college, and man, it's, it's really hard to stick to Islam in college, especially in liberal colleges. When you wear your hijab and you go to college, you're going to hear a lot of criticism. When you say that you stand against homosexuality, LGBTQ, these people, they're going to like, like rip you apart. They'll insult you, they'll criticize you, they'll call you an extremist, and all, they'll call you all these things. But do we stay away from, from sticking to our principles because you know, we fear their criticism? Is that what we're supposed to do? Is that what we're supposed to do? A lot of these Muslims, when they get such criticisms, you know what they do? They try to make excuses for it. Uh, homosexuality is okay. It's, like, it's, it's this, it's that, it's all right. You know, maybe a little bit is okay. With regards to pornography addiction, you know, a lot of these people, they make, you know, everyone is doing it. What is the harm in it? They're not raping a woman directly. So what is the harm in it, right? They try to apply the liberal harm principle, which is devoid of any rational and logical base. Anyway, a whole different topic. Coming back, so don't try to make excuses for the things the Prophet ﷺ has clearly made haram and don't stay away from what the Prophet ﷺ has enjoined, right? Now, human beings, you know, we are always curious and we'll always have doubts, all right? We always have doubts. And just because you have doubts in your mind, it doesn't mean you're a bad person, okay? It doesn't mean you're a bad person. For example, like, you know, you're very genuinely interested in learning about, you know, what Islam says about LGBTQ, like, you know, you're hearing that it's genetic, like a lot of liberal arguments and you're getting certain doubts. It doesn't mean you're a bad person, okay? It just means you're a human being and you're a very curious person. Human beings are naturally curious. It doesn't mean you have a, you know, bad iman as long as you don't accept the doubts and identify with it. Right? Some people, when they get the doubts, they think, oh no, now I'm, I'm becoming a non-Muslim. I've become a munafiq and I've become, become a kafir. And they accept the entire thing wholeheartedly without doing proper research. No, no. All right, so just because you get certain questions in your mind doesn't mean you, you are a bad Muslim. You're a bad Muslim as, you, as long as you don't accept the doubts and identify with it. Some people, you know, I got certain cases where in which, you know, uh, they had something called as pure O. Does anyone know what pure O is? Pure O, the students of psychology here. Pure O. It's basically a category of OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. And in such disorders, like they, they're constantly getting, you know, this persuasive, these thoughts, these blasphemic thoughts about the Prophet, these blasphemic thoughts, negative, you know, thoughts about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all these things. When this happens, you know, there's there's a clear-cut spiritual solution to it. Engage in adhikar, engage in adhikar, read the Holy Quran. There are a lot of lot of solutions for it. All right. So when you have bad thoughts, when you have bad thoughts or you know, questionable things in your mind, you're not a bad person this anxiety in your mind say rajim. have full tawakkul in allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and go ahead and go ahead allah knows you out my friend allah knows your heart more than you know it you know it just because you spent you know a few you know a few very negative environment and you got influenced by it you know with regards to your cognition with regards to your thought does it mean you have completely accepted it all right and shaitan will Try to make you accept it. He'll say, oh, look, having this thought in your mind, that shows that you have a very bad heart. You have a black heart. You don't have Iman, right? And then some people, they get depressed and they say, oh, no, I'm a bad Muslim. I don't have Iman. Now, what is the use of praying? What is the use of making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Allah will not listen to me. They have such thoughts. No, don't have such thoughts. This is shaitan playing with your mind. Don't let shaitan play with your mind. So whenever you get such thoughts, Say, A'udhu Billahi min Shaitan al-Rajeem and it will really, really help you. It will really, really help you. And I'll give you a few solutions and with this, we are going to end. Now, with regards to the sources of doubts, I'm going to explain a few sources of doubts. If you can, you can say R. You can type R in the chat. Uh, if you are not able to relate, you can say no. All right. Now, the first types of doubts that people, that a lot of people have is, you know, teach about the role of woman. Like they say, you know, women have to stay only in the kitchen. They're not supposed to do anything. They have to cover themselves, you know, you know, completely up there, oppressed and there's a prison slump, right? Did you have such doubts? And a lot of these women, especially, you know, in the college campus environments, 
they look around and they see a lot of these feminists propagating such arguments and they get really influenced by it. All right. The next kind of doubt is the hypocrisy of religious people. All right. Some religious people, you know, they have a lot of like big beard and, and you know, they have the Muslim cap, but they, but they don't have the adab. They don't have the adab. They, they act in ways that are really wild and, and immodest. Right. And then you start questioning, like this guy is supposed, like he learned religion for a lot of years. He's supposed to be the, the, the symbol that we should be following, but this is his case. So there's something, some problem with the religion he studied. Like a lot of people have this question, right? And then, you know, the bad things that people do in the name of this religion this is also very, like a very prevalent doubt. And then we have the intolerance that some religious people show towards, you know, other faiths, like, you know, uh, call, like they, they treat other people as, you know, complete, you know, enemies, right? Christians, uh, Hindus are enemies, like, you know, propagating such, you know, extreme arguments, some extreme arguments. And you hear to these things and you're thinking, these people, they were born into a particular religion. They did not do anything wrong. Like they did not choose this way of life and you're having such doubts. And then you have such doubts like, uh, these are very good people. Mahatma Gandhi, he did a lot of good things. Mother Teresa, they did a lot of good things. Are they going to have no help? And you know, such people, they have these doubts and they question the entire religion for it. They question their entire religion for it. Then, you know, the way that religious people sometimes insist that there is, uh, it is true to a certain degree, but some people, they take it to another extreme. Then we have the intolerance that some religious people show towards certain people, like the homosexuals, etc. And then, you know, they have a lot of these doubts, you know, related to these facts. Then we have the philosophical, uh, philosophical and scientific concerns, all right? Uh, the debate over evolution, you know, natural selection versus the creation of God. A lot of people have these doubts while sitting, you know, in their plus two. They're learning about the evolutionary theory, Lamarckian evolution, Darwinian evolution. Uh, if Darwinian evolution is true, like what, what should we believe? Then who created Adam Ali Salatu Islam? Do we have a common ancestor? Right? We call ourselves Homo sapiens. So what about Homo erectus? What about our early fathers? Right? Right? Like what is our root of, of, of you know, uh, creation? Is it natural selection? A lot of doubts with related to evolution. Then there is the uncertainty over the existence of God. You know, people influenced by a lot of these, these you know, uh, militant atheist, you know, thinkers. I don't even call, want to call themselves thinkers. Them thinkers. But anyway, like, does it really, really exist? There is, does it really, really, really exist? Like they have a lot of these questions in their mind. Then the problem of evil and and you know, this is a very, you know, old argument, but still some atheists that bring up <laughs> as if it's some new argument. 350 BC. Well, like it's a very very old argument. It's called as Hujjat uh, al Hujjat al in in Islamic philosophy. Anyway, so they have such kinds of doubts. Then the doubts, feeling that certain religious beliefs or practices do not make sense. For example, for example, they think, why do I need to put my you know uh, pant over my ankles? Like, what like, difference does it make to God who created the entire universe? Does it really like? Does it really make a difference? Does it does it really matter? Does it really matter? Right, you know, they have such they have such questions in their mind, right? Like you know, certain belief practice and religion. For example, praying five times a day. Why do I need to pray five times a day? So, so, so such people have you know, similar kinds of you know philosophical and scientific concerns. Uh, then you know we have the, the the argument, very prominent argument by the atheists who say that uh, oh no, you know you know religion and and you know science cannot coexist at all. And the problem with these atheists is that they don't even know the level of damage atheism has you know, made on, 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 you know, science as a whole. If you learn the history of Soviet Union after 1917, after the establishment of Soviet Union, like they literally tried to hijack science and literally destroyed it, destroyed it. Destroyed it. Destroyed it. For, for the people who are learn more, you can learn more about Lizengoism, all right, Lizengoism and Lizakovich. Anyway, uh, then we have, you know, the, the issues, the, the doubts that arise due to personal trauma. For example, finding that being religious does not make one happy, right? And, uh, you know, they say that religion, it, it basically builds a lot of boundaries, uh, you know, around us. We can't, we can never feel happy, uh, you know, in a religion, everything is haram. You know, I can't go to these parties in the college, right? I can't, you know, I can go to these parties in the college. I can't enjoy my life. When I'm, you know, going, trying to go for, for a trip with my friends, my father and my mother are saying, no, you, you can't go, you know, with your friends. Uh, you know, if there are boys and girls intermixing, your parents say, no, you can't go for that trip. And then you question everything. Why can't I enjoy my life? Are you able to relate? A lot of college students will be able to relate. And then, you know, not feeling welcomed in your faith community. That is something that the converts usually face. They, they convert from atheism and, and liberalism and, and Christianity. 
and then they feel unwelcomed in the new community, then the death of a loved one. So there are a lot of these you know, different sources of doubts. When these doubts come, and these are genuine doubts, if they come to you, don't feel that you're a bad person, but rather, you know, rather than going to depression and anxiety and stress, go to research mode. Try to learn as much as you can. Islam has clear cut answers to all these questions, to all these questions. And when you listen to these beautiful answers, you're completely going to be satisfied. And it's really going to fill you with a lot of iman. Okay? So, so try to research more rather than jump into conclusions based on what, based on what uh, 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 these, these feminists and these liberal atheists say. And then there's something called as cognitive dissonance. And cognitive dissonance is, is a mental state. It's a, it, it's a mental state of discomfort that results from holding two conflicting beliefs, values, or attitudes. I've seen this in a lot of cases where in which you know some people they question evolution. They say evolution is a true, uh, you know, true scientific fact. They speak as if it's a fact, and you know they think on the other side, my religion is saying this. How can I, how can I reconcile between these two? And they just doubt and they go into a state of cognitive dissonance, which is a lot of pressure. It creates a lot of stress in their mind, and they start questioning themselves. They start questioning their you know existence. They go into existential crisis. So cognitive dissonance is a, is a big problem. The solution to cognitive dissonance is learning more about Islam. Because Islam is the haq. It has got answers to all your questions. It has got answers to all your questions. Now, shaitan, he's your greatest enemy. He's your greatest enemy. And he'll keep on trying to deviate you from the path of Islam. He'll, he'll try to constantly, constantly, you know, you know uh, put doubts into your mind. And that actually shows something else. That actually shows you have iman. It actually shows you how you man. You know, shaitan, he affects different people with different things. He affects different people with different things. You know, the reason, you know, why children throw stones at a mango tree is because they're seeing mangoes on the trees, right? Will they be throwing stones at a tree that doesn't bear fruits? Do you think they're going to throw stones at a tree that doesn't have, you know, you know uh, uh, mangoes? Similarly, shaitan, you know, he's trying to harvest your iman. He's trying to take away your iman. And you know why he's throwing stones of doubts at you? Because he knows that you have Iman in you. And that is a good sign. That is a good sign. So you're not a bad person because you have certain doubts. So try to research and try to learn more. And whenever you have certain doubts, like they're very negative, say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem. I want you guys to say it now. Say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem now and say yes in the chat if you have done it. Say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem. And the best way to fight doubt, it is with knowledge. Islam is the haq. Islam is the haq. The light of truth would diminish the darkness of doubts and ignorance. So learn more about the deen. Learn more about the deen. Right? Right? And, and uh, there is actually a particular quotation in Arabic. I forgot who said it. It is, Al-ilmu at-taqwa. Al-ilmu at-taqwa. The more you gather knowledge, the more your taqwa, the fear of God increases in your mind. So try to learn as much as you can. Some people, they think that, you know, I chose my bachelor's as, as biotechnology, as biology, as, as physics, as chemistry. Now I don't have the opportunity to learn, right? This is, this is a false thought. The opportunities are endless in the online world. There are a lot of institutes. There are a lot of institutes, you know, which are present online where in which you can gain a lot of knowledge, a lot of knowledge. I personally know a lot of brothers and a lot of sisters who are doing talab al-ilm, who are learning a lot about Islam, you know, by you know, in parallel doing MBBs and doing engineering and all these things. All right, so don't utilize your online opportunities as much as you can. Bayina Institute, Al Balag Academy, Sape Institute. There are a lot of good institutes. All right. Now this is one you know course that I would suggest if you guys have you know doubts with regards to Islam and you want to know more strategies, you know take this course on Sape Institute. Highly, highly recommended. This is my brother Hamza Zorsis. A wonderful, wonderful researcher, mashallah. He has a good book, The Divine Reality. Divine Reality is also a book, uh, you know, that would that I would highly recommend. How many of you have read Divine Reality? Anyone read Divine Reality? Anyone read uh, uh, Divine Reality? Really good book. Really good book. Highly, highly recommended. Okay, highly, highly recommended. And then there is something else, you know, that would I, I would really, really recommend, and that is to watch Revert Stories. Okay, this is highly recommended. I used to watch it in my childhood. Like, it, it, you know, it used to boost me up. Like, it, it would give me a lot of iman and energy in my heart. If you go to YouTube and type Fahad al Kantari, Fahad al Kantari, Sheikh Fahad al Kantari, you know, he has a lot of these documentaries and he has a series called as Bil Quran Hitadate, which means guided through the Quran. And it talks about the stories of a lot of people who are from, you know, who came to Islam from atheism, who came to Islam from, from you know, Christianity, from, from Buddhism, from Hinduism. 
from from you know different philosophical schools of thought right so it's a, it's a beautiful channel it's a beautiful channel i would so fahid al kandiri try to search it up you can take a screenshot of this particular slide so you don't forget uh, then there is the Muslim convert stories. That is also a really, really good channel. Like you can hear a lot of stories, a lot of you know, people with doubts. Like if you hear such stories and you are able to relate to their stories, you know, you, you'll really, really benefit. You'll really, really benefit. You'll be able to relate and you'll be able to properly navigate through these doubts, inshallah. And people naturally want to see more proof or evidence to substantiate the divine revelation. Okay, these are simple doubts that are cured by learning more about Allah Islam and experiencing more of Allah's signs. All right, of Allah's signs and experiencing these simple doubts is not blameworthy. Okay, it's not blameworthy. So stop blaming yourself. I know a lot of people who just blame themselves. They saying, "I'm a really bad person." You know, you know, I'm a person with no iman. Have you guys ever done it? If you had certain doubts or certain things in your mind, negative things. You know, you say to yourself, I'm a really bad person. No, you're not a bad person. You're a Muslim. You are upon the haqq. So hold on to the haqq. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's seeing what you're going through. So pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is closer to you than your jigla way. Allah knows what's happening inside your heart more than you yourself know it, right? So have full tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whenever you get bad thoughts, you know, just, just say, A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajeem. Recite the Holy Quran and it'll really go away, inshallah. I'll really go away and we'll end with one important point i know that of course the time but i'll end with one important point and that is this you know asking questions it's actually part of intellectual islamic traditions discussions and, and uh, intellectually engaging academic debates all these things it, it's part of the intellectual islamic tradition but the but, but the sad reality today is uh, the critical thinking the aspect of critical thinking is not that much taught to younger kids there's not much taught to young kids and you know we have cases where in which you know, at home, the children, they're getting very genuine doubts and they ask their parents and then their parents say, what are you saying? You're not supposed to ask that question. And they try to suppress and oppress it. Have you seen such cases? They try to suppress and oppress such questions. And these children, they, these kids, they're just naturally curious. They're just naturally curious, right? right? And some parents, you know, just so that they don't lose their image, their face in front of the kid, they try to give an answer which they don't have a clear idea on. And it's probably a wrong answer. It's a very wrong answer. And, you know, the child, when he learns more, he understands that what is what, what his father and his mother said is wrong. And, you know, the basic, basically the guy, you know, he, he judges Islam entirely based on what his father and his mother were saying to him, right? And also, you know, the more you oppress and suppress such questions in younger kids, it's not going to have any positive impact. These kids, you know, these are individuals with brains, right? These are not robots. The more, you know, they advance in their life, you know, uh, the more questions they're going to get and this is going to think this religion that i'm on is not given, even giving me the freedom to 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 you know ask curious questions and very genuinely research and learn and then they're just going to have a very negative view of of, of you know islam as a whole i've seen a lot of such cases so if you have kids don't do such things to your kids like you're harming your kids future so if you don't know the answers to these questions just be very sincere and have the humility to say no or tell him that i don't know the answer to this now but i'll ask to a more well-learned person and then you know i'll get it clarified for you or maybe you can take your kids to to shiuch, to mashayikh to to people who may know the answer and get it clarified all right and get it clarified this this is the way to deal with doubts not oppressing and suppressing it all right okay so so experiencing this simple doubt is not blameworthy but in contrast serious doubts that are rooted in arrogance or denial may rise to may give rise to the level of unbelief all right all right so that is also problematic so, so just like I said earlier, destructive doubts and constructive doubts, right? And this is the final, like, you know, spiritual solution that, that is to always be in dhikr, doing adhikar will soften your heart and will increase your conviction. The morning and evening adhikar, how many of you have done it today? The, the morning adhikar, how many of you have done it today? The morning adhikar. How many have done the morning adhikar? Very good. It's, it's really, really powerful. It is very, 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 you know, if I could say very a hundred times, I would say it. It's that powerful. So stick to it. Stick to the morning and the car. The car, it's, it's, it's very powerful. And also ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for help. Before you ask anyone else, why don't you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator of the entire cosmos, is, is closer to you than your jiggler weed. I mean, who, would you, who more would you want for support? 
Who, who would you want for support? So ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for help always and understand that conviction in deen is the base of Islamic personality. So we have started this long journey for building ourselves. So we've got to have a proper conviction in deen, you know, to properly advance and develop. Otherwise, we are always going to have a lot of these doubts in our mind and the things that I say may not make full sense to you. So build your conviction in deen. If you are having certain doubts, try to reach out to, you know, the to, to counselors, to, to shiul, or trying to do online courses, you know, the courses that I just mentioned, it's, it's going to be of huge, huge benefit, insha, inshallah. With that, we are going to end today's today's session. Uh, the assignment, you know, the, you have two assignments, audio task and video task, and let me remind you one more thing. Now, what is basically going to happen? Like, there's going to be a general trend here, and that is a lot of people is going to stop this journey. By the time we get to the end of this journey, a lot of people are not going to be there. The only people who are going to reach the finishing position in this journey are those people who are very, very sincere and very, very genuine. And it's going to be a test. This journey is basically a test because Allah has give, given you an opportunity, a golden opportunity, how much you are committed to it, how much you are committed to it. And the only sacrifice you're doing here is your commitment. And your commitment can be shown by posting the daily task on a daily basis, the audio task and the video task. So. The audio task is very easy. Post it before tonight. Do a review and recap of today's session, inshallah, uh, so that the people who did not join, they can also benefit, inshallah. Then the video task is, you know, for, for before this week ends, it's actually to post a, a video no less than five minutes about today's topic. It's very simple. So we are ending with the third session with a pro tip, and that is this. You will never always be motivated. And this is connected to the last, you know, uh, pro tip that was given. And that is, you're never always going to be motivated, but you must learn to be disciplined. And discipline is the key here. And that is the primary key for succeeding in this journey of IPD. Okay, you're not going to be motivated every day to do the morning at the car. Sometimes, you know, you're just going to think, I'm too lazy today, I'll just skip it. Or maybe you'll say to yourself, I did it for the past one week. Let me just skip it for one day. You know, what is the problem in skipping it one day, right? You may think to yourself, oh man, I have to post the task list now. I don't feel like, you know, posting it now, you know, I'll just procrastinate and post it tomorrow, etc. All right. If you are waiting for motivation to do the IPD course, if you're waiting for motivation to do anything in your life, whether it's to start a business, whether it's to, you know, do your best in your academics or to start learning for examination, you're never, ever going to succeed. You're never, ever going to succeed. So you must to be disciplined. You must, must learn to be disciplined. And if you learn to be disciplined, you're definitely going to be succeed. You're definitely going to succeed in your life. So stick to that uh, principle. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all with full conviction in deen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from, from uh, a lot of these doubts that are you know, infiltrated into our minds by shaitan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from all this filth that are propounded and propagated for us by these liberals, by these feminists, by these LGBTQ activists that are trying to misinterpret Islam. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from having false images and false understandings and false you know, representative ideas about uh, Islamic theology or Islamic jurisprudence. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from all the traps of these shayateen. Shayateen min al-insi wa shayateen min al-atina fi dunya hasanatan. وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ربنا إننا نسألك حبك وحب من يحبك وحب عمل يقرب إلى حبك وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته جزاك الله خير برد وفي now I would like to call upon sister Rajwa for the conclusion talk Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulihi al-ameen. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Amma ba'd. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Dear brothers and sisters. Hope you all enjoyed this session. It was really informative and made of this hour. May Allah reward our May Allah reward and accept this from us all. In this age of skepticism, we should be we should be so careful about from where we are taking the knowledge. As Brother Wafisha had mentioned in the session, uh, we are living in an Islamophobic world. 
the social media is filled with misinformation misquotations and emotional appeals etc and here we realized how much insight we had gained from a hadith that was always misrepresented so always doubt your doubts and keep in mind that islam is the last word to any isms or ideologies that trying to conquer your mind with these doubts Jazakumullah khair brother Wafishi had for a wonderful and informative session and sister Sophia for your beautiful kirara and sister Atiba for the introduction and and sister Faria for moderating the session may Allah guide us and make us all firm upon his religion rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adhab an-nar rabbana taqabbal minna innaka antas samiul alim wa tub alayna innaka antat tawwabur rahim سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك اشهد ان لا اله الا انت نستغفرك ونتوب اليك واخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته